Evening, ladies and gents. It's uh, Simon Brown here doing the introduction this evening. So this evening, Keith is taking us on to cash flow. And uh, in sense, I mean, I, in, in the newsletter today, I said that cash, cash is king. Absolutely, cash doesn't lie. Uh, and I've always kind of thought cash was quite simple. How much have you got in the bank? I'm suspecting that it's a little more complicated, in part because Keith has said this will be a three-part series. This will be part one. So I think we're on for a bit of a roller coaster. But as always, we'll come out of it smarter and a whole lot better for it. I'm going to hand over uh, to Keith. Thanks, Simon. Appreciate that. Um, just uh, the uh, the webinar tonight is, well, uh, some touch on it. It's, it's uh, number one of three. Uh, we're focusing on, if you remember, the valuation models, and this is the DCF model. So I'll touch on what is number one of three. Um, in the DCF model, but let's, let's do a little recap quickly. If you remember, this is the equity fundamentals. Uh, so the four pillars of fundamentals of profitability being the aim of the business. Liquidity is cash is king. Solvency debt versus risk. Never forget about management, the qualitative factor. All of this leads to evaluation, eventually, eventually an investment decision. Then you get the types of valuations. Market ratios, we've touched on many of them. Price earnings, price to book, EV EBITDA, and, and so on and so on. I encourage you, if, if you didn't see those, you've forgotten some of them, go back and look at the old webinars. We've moved on to, because those are relative models. You're picking them versus other moving variables in the market. We've moved on to the absolute models, which is essentially the discounted cash, uh, cash flow models. And there's two major ones, uh, the DCF, or discounted free cash flow model, and the dividend discount model. This webinar will be on the DCF model, and uh, the next two ones will be as well, because we, we dissect it and we put it back together again, basically. So, once again, a recap, and this one I haven't dropped in for the recaps of previous webinars, but it starts to become very applicable in the absolute models, and particularly in the DCS, where uh, the, uh, quite a while ago I did a webinar on the cost of equity. So... This is simply a very narrow su summary of it. I very much encourage you to once again go back and revisit that webinar. Uh, just, just, just refresh yourself to get to, to get a handle on the subject, be because particularly part three of the DCF, we are we're going to be delving very deeply into this. Uh, just, just to remind you guys, uh, in summary, cost of equity is the required rate of return a shareholder demands for accepting the risk of providing share capital. Basically. It's the cost to the company of issuing shares. I'm not talking to their advisors. I'm talking what does the shareholder demand to get that share. And that's basically a risk versus reward question. The higher risk, the higher the cost of equity. Then you get the weighted average cost of capital, WAC. It's the total cost of a firm's capital taking into account the different amounts of debt and equity. Whereas cost of equity is simply the cost of shares or equity, uh, WAC takes into account the cost of debt, and the cost of debt is the after-tax cost of, in, uh, of financing. It's interest rate, post-tax. But I uh, don't want to spend too much time on that. I encourage you to go back and look, look at the old webinar on cost of equity, where we do go quite, into, uh, quite a bit of depth into that. Um, so the discounted free cash flow model. Now we can start talking about the, the, the meat of this webinar, uh, or the body of it. And the, the DCF model assumes a company's fair value is the present value of all its future free cash flows. I'm going to say that again because this, this really breaks it down, breaks it up into, into three parts of what, the, what the, these three next webinars will be. DCF model assumes a company's fair value is the present value of all its future free cash flows. Two major parts to the DCF model free cash flows, and you have to present value them. That kind of implies that the free cash flows are in the future. Um, we are touching on now what is free cash flow. It's not as simple as it sounds. Um, so part one will be simply, let's work out the free cash flow. So at risk of being redundant to what I just said, uh, what is free cash flow? The definition of free cash flow is, op is really, it's operating cash flows minus capital expenditures. Let's, let's go a little bit more in depth with it, where the formula for free cash flow is EBIT, post-tax, 
plus depreciation and amortization, less changes in working capital, less capex. Um, I'm sure I lost almost all of you there. That's, that's no problem because this whole formula, each one of these components, we're going to go into depth now. Let's, let's look at them in detail. So the first one was EBIT times brackets one less the tax rate, close brackets. What is EBIT? It's simple. Remember, if, 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 like, once again, I'm touching the old webinar where we've done, we looked at EV EBITDA. Um, the second part of the equation, EBITDA, is earnings before interest depreciation uh, and amortization, uh, interest tax depreciation and amortization. EBIT, without the DA, is simply earnings before interest and tax. Basically, EBIT is operating profit, in a nutshell. That's really it. And then the reason why we multiply EBIT by one less the tax rate is because we multiply, we're trying to strip out the tax the company would pay. Basically, trying to get EBIT post-tax. Because don't forget, tax is a drawdown on cash flows. You have to pay them. It goes to SARS, it goes, goes to the government, it doesn't go to the company. So you need to strip out the tax amount from the operating profits. The next the next part of, of the free cash flow equation was depreciation and amortization. In this, this, this is also, this is both the most simple part of this equation and arguably the most complex. Because where, whereas I use the term depreciation and amortization and you simply add them back and you add them back because depreciation and amortization, depreciation, you depreciate assets after you bought them. Amortization, you pay for goodwill or R&D or intangibles and you amortize it over its useful life. Both of those, you paid the cash. The cash has already been paid ages ago in the future, uh, or ages ago in the past, sorry. What you're really doing in this case is these are accounting book entries. So they're, they're what we call non-cash flow items, non-cash flow adjustments going through an income statement. We are adding them back. And this is why it's, it's, it's so simple. We're trying to get back to the core cash flow of the business. These influence the accounting profits of the business, but they don't actually influence the cash flows. Once you bought the, the, the uh, property and the plant and equipment, um, the depreciation is just a book entry. Thereafter, you're just earning free cash flows off it. So very simple in concept. You add it back to the post-tax EBIT, uh, to, to bring it back in line with the actual cash flows from the operating uh, portion of the business. But, and this is why, this is very simple, but it's very complicated at the same time, it's not just limited to depreciation and amortization. These are the more common, and in fact depreciation is the most common. Amortization is there in a lot of companies, not all of them. But basically, this is the wide open definition, add back all non-cash flow items that have influenced EBIT. Anything above operating profit level, that is a, 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 an adjustment, like a fair value adjustment, uh, impairments to goodwill, BEE, FS3 adjustments getting pushed through, all of these are non-cash flow items. And all you've got to know, all you've got to, the only question you've got to answer to work out if it's a non-cash flow item is, in the, in, in the current financial year, or in future ones, or it, it, has money changed hands? And if the answer has, it changed hands in another financial year, in this current financial year, when you're accounting for it, it's non cash for item. If outside of the reporting period, it was paid for or, or it was received, it's non cash for item. So very broad, and you're going to find a lot of funnies, particularly in this part. But I'm not going to linger on it, so let's jump forward. Then you get changes in net working capital. Very simple concept. Working capital, if you remember, one of the fundamentals is li uh, liquidity cash is king. Well, this is, this, that, that centers around a lot of working capital. What is working capital? It is creditors that are actually part financing the business because you haven't paid them yet but yet you already have the goods or services or whatever. Um, less debtors because, uh, well, you've given them goods or services, products or services, but they haven't paid you yet. Less inventory, which is the stock you have to carry on hand. 
So in other words, if your creditors is massive, your debtors is null, and your inventory is null, you have a positive working capital. In other words, your creditors are financing part of the business. But this is getting too technical. Just take it at face value. Working capital is creditors, less debtors, less inventory. So change in net working capital is simply the creditors at the end of the year, less the debtors at the end of the year, less the inventory at the end of the year, and that is your net working capital at the end of the year. That less the net working capital at the start of the year. Has the, has the net working capital grown or decreased? If it's grown, well, your company is having to finance that. So it should be a negative because it's, it's drawing down on your free cash flow. Basically, working capital is a financing cost a business must carry. And a build-up in working capital, being a massive build-up in inventory and, uh, and uh, debtors and inventory that outstrips a, a growth in creditors, is it actually draws down the free cash flow. Likewise, um, you know, if, if your debtors are paying down and your inventory is winding down, you actually, actually can get a release of working capital. Um, so th the important part is this, is this isn't net working capital, it's the change in net working capital year on year or period on period that is important in the free cash flow. Is it building up, declining or staying flat? Then you have CapEx which is a, a short for, a formal co, uh, colloquialism for capital expenditure. Um, there's really two major types of capex. There's maintenance and expansion capex. Maintenance capex is keeping everything running, basically. Expansion capex is really orientated towards growing. Uh, it, they're making the factory bigger, they're digging another shaft in the mine, they're buying more cars for their fleets, or trucks for the fleet. Maintenance is just keeping things running. What you built, uh, and if you own a house, you'll come to appreciate exactly what maintenance capital is, CapEx is. So uh, now CapEx, the companies aren't, aren't uh, dictated to by IFRS to disclose the separation between maintenance and expansion capital, uh, expansionary capital, CapEx. So, um, most of them don't. Some, some of them do, but the, the, the huge majority of them don't. And all of them tend to lump it in cash flow from investing operations, where you don't really get the split between maintenance and expansion, but you do, and this is where you find that the, the cash expenditure. Remember, we calculate free cash flow, cash is important. So it's the cash expenditure on CapEx during the period, and that'll be under purchase of PPE, purchase of land, purchase of mineral rights, purchase of this, purchase of that, uh, and don't forget, there's also sale. Um, so we're looking at net capex, because uh, a good example is, is the logistics companies that run these fleets, as the cars get old and the trucks get old, they sold it. So they actually get their residual values back in. So, so have a look at the net capex, expansionary maintenance. Uh, how you find the split between, because where you find CapEx spending is in cash flow for investing uh, activities. That split between maintenance and expansion, um, but it's not actually explained. Where you can find that is talk to management. Not always possible, have a look in budgets. Once again, not always possible. Have a look at expansion plans, have a look at presentations on the website, attend the AGMs. There's, None of these are perfect, but you can start to get an idea. Is the company growing? Is it being, staying stagnant? Um, and that they will give you the expansionary capex. The maintenance capex, you can you can use a rule of thumb that the depreciation rates imply the capex spend because assuming a company replaces its capex items as and when they are fully depreciated, then its depreciation should start to match its capex and it's maintenance capex. Makes sense, because if, you, if your car, you're running on an economic use for life of 10 years, and at the end of the 10 years it's useless, you're gonna have to buy a new car. So you depreciate it over 10 years, and in fact the maintenance spend uh, to keep it running for those 10 years will start to roughly match that. Um, but once again, not, not perfect, um, but you can start to get an idea of, 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 of the base, baseline of maintenance spend. Out of, uh, out of economic useful lives in, in the, uh, the annual financial statements. 
So we've, we've spoken at length about all these different pieces of free cash flow. Let's put it all together again. Remember, free cash flow and the emphasis is on cash flow, cash here, where we're looking at operating pro profit post-tax. We're adding back all the non-cash flow items that changed operating profit. So pro operating profit is starting to get more in line with the amount of money we made from operations. Then we add the change net working capital. Um, was, you know, were debtors paying, uh, being, uh, paying us back slower? Do we have a build up in inventory and stock? And likewise. Um, and finally, we take out the capex spend, because the capex spend is the heart of the business to keep it going. You need property, plants, and equipment. You need a factory. You need, you need to maintain the mine. You, all these sort of things. And in, in reality, that takes cash away from shareholders. Uh, so hence, don't forget to take that out. In other words, putting that, putting the whole free cash flow together, we can start to see what changes the company's free cash flow. First of all, EBIT. Well, EBIT is simple. It's operating profits. If profits rise, free cash flow rises. Uh, Post-tax rate. If the tax rate drops, free cash flow rises. You're paying less tax. Uh, depreciation, amortization. The, the, uh, once you start stripping out cash flow, non-cash flow items, uh, you you will see a rise in f a free cash flow. Well, it not not always true. There can be fair value adjustments of things propping up profits, not depressing them. In other words, the non-cash flow items are often where the funnies are in the income statement. So not always a good thing. Just check those out. Net working capital. The less working capital, the better. The less working capital you have, the less financing you have to, the less cash you have to, you have to absorb into that. And as a company, you're financing a working capital. So if you can minimize your working capital, in fact, even in the perfect position, and there's a couple of companies out there that have that, you have a negative working capital cycle. In fact, your working capital finances you and not the other way around. Then finally, CapEx. Less being spent on capital items or the less the capital items need maintaining the more free cash flow you have. Now, this is not always a good thing. There's a very good example of pick and pay that a couple of years ago was a shining gem of the retail market, retail sector in the JSC. It was printing money, but it was printing money because it had stopped spending on expansionary capex and it stopped spending sufficient, uh, reinvesting sufficient amounts of cash back in itself. So in the short term, it looked fantastic. In the long term, well, we've seen what happened. It's, it, it's on the back foot now. It's got all sorts of problems. It's having to spend even more to catch up with where all the other guys are. So you can influence your free cash flow from CapEx, but there needs to be a balance. Are they spending on good items? Is it properly spent? Most important ones really is EBIT, profits rising, and the tax rate. But all the others do impact it. So um, just a final note on free cash flow, is the free cash flow is the cash flow available to all the financiers of the company. In other words, this is for the enterprise. If you remember, we did the EV EBITDA, enterprise value uh, divided by EBITDA a webinar quite a while ago. Um, go refresh yourself, because I talk about what the enterprise value is. Free cash flow, you notice I didn't include anything about interest, anything about debt in here. You're calculating how much Free cash flow is available to service the people, the providers of capital of a business. Now, those providers of capital is, yes, it's the shareholders, but it's also the debt holders. So, so and in, you will see this in our next two webinars where we delve, where we complete the, the discounted uh, free, uh, DCF model. You will see how this becomes a very important point. But uh, I'm just noting it here so, so that you don't get the wrong message. And I'll encourage you to go watch uh, the EV EBITDA uh, webinar where we do discuss enterprise value, just as a reminder. So in conclusion, the DCF model, part one, where we look at the free cash flow. Free cash flow is post-tax operating profits, post-tax EBIT. Add back all the non-cash flow items, or uh, less or add or take into account the changes of working capital and less capex spend. 
we work through all the individual parts of, of, of the free cash flow, understand which parts move with uh, like a, uh, each of these parts have different different variables moving them, uh, and then also bear in mind that the free cash flow is enterprise free cash flow. We haven't taken it into account debt yet. Uh, so the, the final part of the conclusion is just giving you a taste of the next two webinars because this one was probably a fairly, a fairly opaque, fairly um, uh, abstract one, but but you you see how it makes sense. Now DCF, uh, we worked up the free cash flow. Part two is a DCF is forward looking. Remember, it's the present value of all future cash flows or future free cash flows in the business. So the second part is you're going to look at the intricacies uh, of forecasting the free cash flow. Now, now to calculate it, you need to you need to forecast it in order in order to do a DCF. That would be part two. Part three is remember it's the present value of all future free cash flows. I'll show you how to present value it into one single number that eventually is the fair value. So guys, it was a bit of a long-winded webinar, and I apologize for that. But uh, yes, do we have any questions? No, Keith, short, to the point, and as always, boggled my brain. Um, the part that struck me, uh, cash to providers of capital, that, that made, that, that, that was, to me was the killer sentence that came towards the end. Um, and I, I, I forgot the first part, but in essence, that would have provided, provided the capital, who's not only shareholders, equity, of course, it's debt. And a couple of questions come in, folks. If you've got questions, put them in the text box. Uh, I've got some already popping up. Um, Mishudu's asked two questions. Um, how come some companies get a tax credit? And I think she's probably talking in the smaller cap space, which will fit perfectly. And cash flow statement. That number at the end, is it a real number? Okay, tax credit. No, we need to distinguish between true tax credit and what's coming through on the income statement. The income statement is affected by, and I'm really not going to scare you guys by explaining it, it's a, it's a thing called deferred tax. If you have any chart of the content friends, ask them this and you'll get a string of swear words. It's one of the more abstract and complicated parts where you're actually trying to match future taxes with present incomes and, uh, and all messy, messy stuff. So what you often get when a company reports a loss is they'll get a tax credit. So they so their operating their EBIT or their operating profit will be actually an operating loss. And then you'll get a positive number coming through in the tax so that the net loss is actually less. What that is really is is they're using deferred tax to say that the company has an assessed loss that will be realized in the future when it earns profits. So, but the assess, but the loss that created that assessed loss for tax purposes was was incurred in this period. So we recognise on the cruel principle of accounting in this period. Um, the cash, uh, cash flow statement, which is the one I turn to almost always, uh, about second or third when I look at results. At the end of it, they give you a number. We have got 111 million. Do they really have 111 million, or is there some? And now Keith is scratching his head. We've confused him. Well, the answer is yes and no. Ah, it's a cartoon. <laughs> you know, I think I think the best way to phrase it is is actually how they phrase it at the end. And so look carefully. They don't call it cash. They call it cash and cash equivalents. Good point. No, and good point. They call it cash and cash equivalents. So basically, it means that they can be holding uh, sufficient liquid assets that, that, that they can liquidize it quick enough in a liquid market that it counts as cash. Now, the, now in reality, the final figure for cash and cash equivalents is, 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 tends to be pretty infallible. Yeah. And, and what I also do in a, in a cheat, I go to, 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 to income and I see if there's an interest line. If they claim to have a billion rand cash, Where's the interest? Should be somewhere. True, true. Net financing cost, and that, that's a very good point. But bear in mind that uh, they could have had a massive payment right at the end of the year. Sure. And, 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 and now I'm thinking particularly companies who say, we have no debt, we have lots of cash. Well, then, if you've got no debt and you've got lots of cash, I want to see the interest. Some great questions coming through. Victor says, uh, ooh, and it just suddenly set up my screen. Uh, FCF, in this case, is actually FCFF free cash flow to firm and would be pre-debt payments. 
Yes. Yes. We're working with enterprise values here. There, there's, there's, once again, not, not to confuse everybody, but there's actually multiple approaches to DCS. You can start to factor in into free cash flows future debt drawdowns, um, where you basically are calculating equity value up front because you're calculating financing within the free cash flow. I prefer not to do that because who knows what debt the company is going to do and what pay down they have and what relationship they have with the bankers and, and the luck. So that's not my approach. Uh, and, and also it becomes very convoluted then. I prefer free cash flow, and you can visualize it when you're calculating free cash flow. It is literally the cash at the end of the day the company's made. Mr. Lang's got a, a pair of questions. Uh, the variables of free cash flow, are they already available in financial statements? And I think the answer is no. Fortunately, yeah, the answer is no. Uh, and your, your most challenging one because bear in mind what I, what I told you here was a snapshot of free cash flow. When you're calculating a DCF model, it's not the past that, or, that's important. You actually will be forecasting this. So the future is, is, is the only way of, of uh, is really your relevance here. But, but in, in the sense of getting, getting an idea for, uh, especially the CapEx variable is, is, can be very big and very challenging. Whereas the working capital, not even management knows what their debtors are going to pay them next year. So, so th that variable becomes very open to interpretation. And it's the challenging of investing. We've got a lot of data, a heck lot more than we had 10, 20 years ago. We don't have everything. And, and I suppose that may be sufficient theory. We won't go down that road. Catherine asks, is operating profit margin a good indicator from what you've taken there? And, and, I hope, I mean, it's one of my preferred. I, I, I get operating profit, I divide it into revenue, I get a margin. Is that getting bigger or smaller? Well, what's quite useful to use operating profit with, if you're using operating profit margin, uh, then you want to, what you really want to look at is operating cash conversion, cash conversion ratio. When you're taking the operating profit and you're dividing it by the cash flow operations in the cash flow statement. So you're seeing if operating profit is growing very fast, but the company is racking up debtors and having to invest in inventory, you'll find that there's probably an outflow in cash flow from operations. So what you want is you want a, a nice match between the two. And, and uh, there's actually a company out there, ISA, that uh, they, they track themselves in this cash conversion ratio where they want their profits to be matched by cash, cash flow directly. And so if you're looking at a high operating margin, it's, that becomes very, that's obviously a good thing. But it becomes much more relevant if, if you look at it in terms of cash conversion, because then you sure the company isn't chasing revenues and pushing things through from other years, borrowing from from your know, future years into its revenue and this and that and that. But it's not actually matched by cash flows, which is a very worrying situation to be in. So, not, not sure if I answered the question there. No, you answered it brilliantly, and it's a good point. So, so operating margin is important. But if you're spending all that operating profit on, on beer and good red wine, it's not important. So as is usually the case in investing, is you've got to, you can't look at things in isolation. Operating margin, if it's growing and looking healthy, lacquer, how much gets to the bottom line? Kumba is an example where a truckload and, of course, ISA. And, and uh, first disclaimer, I own ISA. I think Keith yep, does. I, I do as well. Um, we published one of the reasons. Uh, go to smallcaps.coza or simonbrown.coza. You see our holdings. JJ's asked the company website for ISA. JJ, I'm not sure, but it's uh, ISA Holdings or the JC code is ISA, and you'll find more information there. They uh, are anti-hacking, spam, they're a security, IT security company. Uh, last question from Luke. Does anybody provide a service where these analysts are performed as new company info comes out? In other words, is there a cheat sheet? Um, Luke, I think there's, I'm going, to give, I'm going to give two parts and then I'm going to hand it to Keith. Um, the easy answer is, well, go to Tebe, get Keith's reports, he'll do the hard work for you. Of course, he won't do it in every one of the 400 companies, he'll do it in what he covers, but you know, he does it and then he sends it off to you and you can just, I go to the bottom line, is it a buy, sell or hold? I think that Profile Media, I know in the online share trading environment and probably other providers there, probably on Tebe and, and other stockbrokers' online environment, they do have a lot of what they call ratio analysis. 
Um, and I'm never 100% sure what's there, but that's where I will start to look. And if you drop me a mail, I can send you some links how to find that data, Simon at just one lap dot com, uh, where you can find it. Of course, it's it's historic in that it's a timestamp. It's for interim and final numbers, um, and then it's how they determine, but they do disclose that. Keith, I mean, there's no, it, it's hard yeah, work. Well, I mean, Bloomberg, Bloomberg Reuters, you know, these guys, all, all the major data providers, in some essence, for for the most liquid and sometimes all the way down to the bottom stocks, have free cash flow that they calculate and this and that. What you have to be careful of is two things. Some touch, some touch on one. The uh, first one is it's historical. Historical free cash flow is only so important. You aren't buying the past, you're buying the future here. That's what investing is. Then the second thing is you have to be very careful because the data providers have different definitions for things. So you could find you and, and and depending on who you use and where you find it at, phone them up, phone the call center, ask them if, if they don't disclose it, ask them for the formula how they got that number, uh, and then you can start to get a comfort and you can start to compare it and and but uh, yeah, so definitions change and it is historical. Be very careful of that. Yeah, that that formula and then that's the key thing. I, I mean, I need as well. There's there's a bunch of providers, but check that formula, that that's the critical component because, I mean, I, I've seen, I mean, price earnings ratio, well, what earnings do you use? Core earnings, headline earnings, core headline cool. earnings, discontinued core headline earnings? Here's an interesting point. Uh, Annette Bridge uses their definition of price earnings as the dilute headline earnings per share. Profile media, my understanding is that they use headline earnings per share. Yeah. That's and that, that can sometimes be quite a big difference between the two. Yeah, I suppose in a sense, if this were easy, we'd all be driving Ferraris. Uh, folks, that's going to be it for tonight. We've hit our 30 minutes plus a bit, uh, and no more questions coming through. Some great questions, I really appreciate. And I, I think this did, it did boggle my brain a bit, but I think I, I, I took some good stuff away. One being, it's cash to, pr to provide it with capital. And, uh, Operating profit margin, important, but how much of that becomes real money in the bank? As always, Keith, thanks a lot. Uh, ladies and gents, thanks for attending. Guys, thanks very much, and I strongly encourage you to see part two and part three, where this will make a lot more sense when, when you put all the pieces of DCF together. Yeah, they'll be up, uh, well, I suppose we'll do them in about four weeks or so, and of course this video will be up tomorrow, uh, and you can go and revisit for the bits that were particularly painful. Thanks all. Cheers.